Hello, everybody. Welcome to tonight's webinar. Uh, we will be focusing on progressive MS for the August webinar. Uh, this webinar series is brought to you by Can Do Multiple Sclerosis, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada. My name is Rachel Lottie, Programs Coordinator for Can Do MS, and I will be your moderator this evening. Can Do MS delivers health and wellness education programs to help families with MS thrive. Please visit our website, cando-ms.org, to learn more about the Can Do MS's online and nationwide in-person programs. Can Do MS is excited to partner with the National MS Society to bring you 12 webinars in 2018. The mission of the National MS Society is to help people affected by MS live their best lives as they stop MS in its tracks, restore what has been lost, and end MS forever. You can explore other societies' programs, services, resources, and connection opportunities at nationalmssociety.org. We will save about 15 minutes at the end of this webinar for questions and answers. If you have a question during tonight's presentation, you can type it in using the questions chat box on your control panel. And I encourage all of you to be active participants in this discussion. If you have any de technical difficulties during the call, you can contact the GoToWebinar support line at 877-582-7011. This presentation is being recorded and will be archived on the Can Do MS and National MS Society's website. You can download a copy of tonight's presentation as well as our August library article which provides some great resources on progressive MS from your control panel. You will also be able to access these resources in the follow-up email that will be sent out by the end of the day tomorrow. Our speakers tonight include nurse practitioner Denise Bruin, psychologist Roz Kahl, and physical therapist Mandy Rorig. And now I would like to turn the presentation over to Denise to get us started. Denise. Thank you. All right, so our objectives for this evening, participants and their support partners will learn how progressive MS differs from relapsing forms of MS, how primary progressive MS differs from secondary progressive MS, the various treatment strategies, how to plan for unpredictable progression of disability, how to incorporate wellness strategies, and how to recognize and manage emotional issues related to progressive MS. So tonight, we're going to focus a lot on dimensions of wellness as we talk about some examples of people living with progressive MS. Uh, as uh, Rachel mentioned, uh, Can Do MS is a health and wellness education program. And this is really important for tonight's presentation with progressive MS, they can tend to get so focused on their multiple sclerosis and on the treatment of their multiple sclerosis that they tend to neglect other important areas of wellness. And this diagram on the screen shows you all of the areas of wellness that can do wants to help people focus on so that they can thrive. So as we talk about some of the vignettes uh, in the slides coming up, we're going to talk about these areas of wellness, such as relationships, people's emotional well-being, um, how they're functioning cognitively, and, and what's, what life is like at work and at home. So just keep this diagram in your mind as we move ahead and talk. And now, Mandy, could you um, introduce the MS team that we're going to be talking about? So this is a diagram of hopefully your MS team, people that you've surrounded yourself as you're going on your journey dealing with multiple sclerosis. So this would involve your neurologist, your nurse practitioner, a psychologist or neuropsychologist, a physical therapist, occupational therapist, a dietitian, a speech language pathologist, and an exercise physiologist. And Mandy's back. Um, so these are just some members of your team 
not all patients dealing with MS need all members of these teams, um, but this is kind of a good overview of people that might be involved in your care. Thank you, Denise. And that just shows that the team, you need a team yes. to deal with the unpredictability of MS and the unpredictability of technology. So thanks, yes. Denise. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next I'm going to go into some of the multiple sclerosis classifications. Often patients will ask me, even after taking care of them for years, what type of MS they have. This can sometimes be very confusing um, to patients. Most patients do have relapsing forms of MS, so this is about 85% of patients that are diagnosed with MS. This is diagnosed, and we'll go over this a little bit more in a, another slide, um, but this is usually characterized by having relapses. Sometimes people call them flares or an exacerbations. So this is when there is active inflammation going on in someone's central nervous system. Many patients don't understand what a relapse is if somebody ask them, asks them if they're having a relapse. So I like to use the analogy of little fires going on in their central nervous system causing symptoms. So usually with time or giving the patient steroids, that puts the flame out, puts the fire out, which could improve symptoms. There still might be some residual disability left over, and there's always going to be that scar there. Um, sometimes it's so small we don't always see it on an MRI, but this is what we're looking at on an MRI is to see how many of these scars somebody has. So with progressive MS, this is thought to be not so much an inflammatory process, but more of a degenerative process where things just kind of, um, we lose nerves and axons over time. We're not sure why that happens, but this usually causes more of a slow, chronic decline in one's function without having relapses. So looking at more of just the progressive MS, um, and this is what the, the highlight of our talk is tonight. First, we're going to talk about secondary progressive MS. So without treatment, about 50% of people who are living with relapsing forms of MS oftentimes will transition to what we call secondary progressive MS within to 15 to 20 years. These numbers are a little bit old. Um, this is before we had some of the very effective therapies that we have now. So I like to think that this number is probably less than that, um, probably not quite 50% and or probably takes longer than 15 to 20 years to get to that point. But in this phase, there's a gradual worsening of existing neurologic signs and symptoms. And typically patients do not have a relapse. Oftentimes patients will ask me, if I'm not having a relapse, am I still relapsing and remitting, or am I more progressive? We tell our patients in our clinic, you don't go to bed relapsing and wake up the next morning progressive. This is something that over time we decide together, oftentimes based off of what the patient's experiencing, as well as what the exam shows and what the MRI shows. But again, this is not usually new symptoms. This is gradual worsening of issues somebody's already dealing with. Secondary progressive MS does not have a set criteria and is not part of an MS diagnostic criteria. So oftentimes, again, there's no set um, guidelines from the MS kind of world that we live in dealing with patients with MS that tells us that somebody's secondary progressive. There is one treatment that is technically FDA approved for treating SPMS, and that's mitoxantrone. It's very rarely used nowadays, though, because there is a very high risk, and there is a max dose that patients can take. So moving on to primary progressive MS, there is a set criteria for primary progressive MS. Um, so what this is, is when a patient first comes to us with the question of MS, we should take a very careful history of the patient's neurologic health. So we need to see that there's documentation of at least one year of disability progression. And there are usually specific MRI findings we're looking for. And more and more, we're going back, unfortunately, in some ways, to doing lumbar punctures on patients to look at their cerebral spinal fluid because this oftentimes can tell us some other clues of what the patient's dealing with. 
Um, last year, there was finally the first medication that was approved for slowing down primary progressive MS. This is called Ocrevus or Ocrelizumab. It is not approved for secondary progressive MS. It's only approved for primary progressive MS. And in the clinical trial, which was called a ratio, it was shown to slow down the progression by about 25%. It wasn't shown to improve anything, just to hopefully slow progression down. So regardless if somebody is secondary progressive MS or primary progressive MS, oftentimes it's the same management that we discuss with our patients. So disease-modifying treatments, like the ones I already mentioned, sometimes we use other treatments off-label um, to see if this might help with some progression, especially if somebody does seem to be having relapses intermittently. We do a lot of symptom management, such as managing the bladder, mood, which Roz will talk about more later, fatigue, which is something that Mandy will also talk about, neuropathic pain, which is different than the type of pain, oh, different than the type of pain that um, we use narcotics to treat. This is more treated with oftentimes seizure medications or physical therapy or biofeedback. Um, go forward one, please. Yes. Um, in rehabilitation, which can be physical therapy and occupational therapy. I often really have my patients focus on their health and healthy living and wellness. I love it when somebody comes to me, um, they've been diagnosed with MS, it feels like the world is over, and a year later after dealing with this diagnosis, they're actually healthier than when they first walked through our door. Because it's the first time somebody's actually said, you know, quit smoking, you got to get to bed on time, you got to manage when you say yes and no to things, you got to look at your diet, you need to exercise. So oftentimes at the end of it, patients come out actually a little bit healthier. And I often recommend my patients just be on top of clinical trials that are out there. I'm lucky that I work at a university center that we offer a lot of clinical trials. We can't be involved in all of them, obviously. Um, but there are some trials that are nearby that maybe we're not involved in that patients might um, benefit from. So I do recommend that all patients keep a close eye on um, clinicaltrials.gov. If you type in MS and anything that you're kind of interested in with MS, it's a very easy search engine that you can see different clinical trials. And maybe you're not interested in being in a trial, but at least it kind of gives you an idea of what research is going on. Okay, so next I am going to hand it over to Mandy if she's... Uh, I'm here. Okay, yay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, for the technical difficulties. So I'm glad I can uh, be with all of you audio. So we're going to move forward through the rest of the presentation. We are going to present two vignettes two case studies, however you would like to describe them, to illustrate the roles that the healthcare team has when it comes to managing progressive multiple sclerosis and how we work with their the people with MS as well as their support partners and their families. So the first vignette that we're going to introduce is Ashley and Dawn. So we'll talk about Ashley first. She is a 58-year-old female woman. She's diagnosed in MS, with MS back in 2008. She works as an administrative assistant to her county attorney. She provides the primary income for the family, for her and her husband, as well as the health insurance. She's on a disease-modifying therapy and has been for eight years. So overall, a very stable disease at this point via the MRI. MRI. However, she's begun to notice stumbling. She's catching her right foot when she walks. She's falling nearly weekly, both at work and home. Her coworkers are even starting to notice not only that she's struggling physically, but also that she's having some challenges with her typing and misplacing phone messages. And unfortunately, MS is having an impact on Dawn as well as, it, as, well as Ashley. Dawn is 10 years older than she is. He's been retired, though, for five years from a construction career. Um, some chronic back pain is what caused him to, to, he was forced into retirement because of the chronic back pain. He's significantly worried about finances, his health insurance, their health insurance, and overall life planning and long-term planning. 
together as a couple, things have kind of headed a, a poor direction. They're eating more fast food because of Ashley's exhaustion after work. They've both gained weight. He has high blood pressure. He, they both have high cholesterol. Ashley um, holds on to Don quite often for balance. And he doesn't have the heart to say, hey, you know what, sweetie, that really, really hurts. And it, it aggravates his back pain even more. Um, their communication and their intimacy are both challenged quite a lot. So they have a, they have a lot going on as a couple. So we want to first start by asking all of you the polling question. And the polling question is, which healthcare provider should Ashley and Don consult with first? And sadly, since I can't see the response, I'm going to ask Rachel, if you don't mind, or one of my um, colleagues to comment on what the responses are, please. Sure, and we'll just give a moment for people to provide their answers. Thank you, everybody, for your input. All right, and let's go ahead and see what our uh, participants have to say. This is Roz. I'm going to just jump in here since Mandy can't see this, but I'm I'm actually excited to see that so many people thought that they should consult um, a mental health professional because I think that's a good starting point to help them with their communication and the changes in their lives, um, but also that they should be seeing a physical therapist um, to talk about rehabilitation and the problems um, that Ashley is having with tripping and falling because we need to keep her safe. And of course, to consult with a nurse um, about other symptoms she may be having and whether her treatment's on target. It's important to know there's no right answer here. Mm -hmm. This is just to find out where you think they should start. So thank you for your input. Thanks, Roz. And we're going to go ahead and first chat with Denise about what are the healthcare priorities for this couple. Thanks. So this is a very common scenario. Um, first of all, I love, love, love when my patients bring a family member with them to the appointment. Um, it keeps the patient a little bit more honest, and oftentimes the family member has a different insight into what's going on at home. So my first questions for Ashley would be, what are her priorities? You know, she's worried about working. Does she want to keep working? Is this sustainable? Or is she really struggling each day? Is just, you know, worse and worse trying to get to work? Or is her priority just to, you know, not fall and she wants to keep working as long as possible? Um, many of us don't ask for help. We feel like we're a burden, whether we are dealing with a chronic illness or not but we don't wanna ask for help. So does she ask for help from Don? Does she ask for help from other people? They talk about how um, dinner and meals are a challenge. It looks like they have a very traditional relationship here where Ashley comes home and makes dinner, but maybe Don could do some of the cooking and maybe they don't have to go out for fast food. Maybe on Sundays they plan their meals out for the week where they freeze things and come, come home and have a much healthier and cheaper um, home cooked meal. What could they be doing together? You know, it sounds like they both could use some healthier tips. I often encourage my patients and their family member, if they're both smokers, they have to quit together. Just the patient can't be quitting. It's nearly impossible to do if you're living with a smoker. So oftentimes choosing a healthier lifestyle together really helps. And are there other things that could be contributing to Ashley's current issues that she just hasn't mentioned? Is there kind of an elephant in the room that we need to be talking about. Okay, Mandy, do you want to go through some physical therapy priorities? Yeah, thanks, Denise. So, so sadly, Ashley is, is falling much, much too often. So my first and foremost priority for her is to help reduce her fall risk. So one of, one of the things that we do as physical therapists is to work with this couple to do a little bit of detective work to figure out what might be going on and when she's falling, what's happening when she's falling, where is she falling, and kind of determine why and, and how we can, can problem solve this. So we would talk about that a little bit. And in that, we would, I would provide a little bit of education for, for this couple about how balance normally works for our, our bodies and how our, how our balance works as we move in our, in our daily lives. 
So there are essentially two systems that help with balance. Our motor systems, which is having sufficient strength, sufficient range of motion, sufficient timing and sequencing of our muscles to, to stay balanced and stay steady. And the second system is our sensory system. So it's our visual acuity. It's our ability to see properly, to move around objects and people. And our second system, subsystem, would be the vestibular system or the inner ear that interprets rotational movement as well as translational movement forward and backwards or up or down. And lastly, the touch sensation. So that ability to touch and feel the floor, feel the ground with her feet. So if Ashley would tell me, hey, you know what, I, I really often trip and fall when I'm walking into the copy room and it's really dark when I first walk in and it's a really plush carpet, that would kind of start to clue me into, hey, okay, when her vision is compromised, she struggles more with her balance. When the surface is a little bit tricky, she struggles with her balance. And then add to that the fact that she has, has some drop foot that may be causing a little bit more issue with her motor systems. This is a type of scenario that we could practice as well as figure out ways to compensate to reduce her risk for falls. So regardless of, of what the environment is or what's going on, we need to know those circumstances because it does allow the PT to go back to those systems of balance and kind of see, hey, where can we intervene and compensate and where can we use exercises or where can we use mobility aids to help us, help us move forward and become safer. So in addition to the environment, um, maybe fatigue is contributing to her falls. Maybe falls are only happening at the end of the day or after a long walk or when she's overheated. So again, maybe incorporating use of a mobility aid or having a device like the one pictured here, which is an AFO to help with the foot drop, may help minimize that fall risk. But again, big picture, we have to describe to the physical therapist what are the circumstances, what are the situations when these falls are happening. We also need to, for Ashley to figure out an exercise program for her abilities and that are sensitive to the fluctuations of her condition. So what I often recommend for folks is to have exercise programs or exercises that they can do on days when maybe they're feeling really great, things are clicking, things are moving, and then exercises that they can do on days when maybe, you know what, I'm just not operating on all cylinders and I really need alternative options and to recognize that that's okay. And part of having a suitable exercise program that's sensitive to those fluctuations is also having a good understanding of what exercises versus physical therapy or rehabilitation versus physical activity. So physical activity is any movement beyond a seated or kind of a laying down position. So this could be doing your laundry, this could be doing the dishes, this could be preparing meals, this could be just simply standing during commercials to get a nice stretch. Um, whereas exercise is, is very specific, it's structured, it has an intended um, intention for consistency and to try to optimize overall mobility. You take those two and compare it to rehabilitation or PT. In PT, we actually focus both on exercise and physical activity. We try to optimize and improve both. But in PT, there's a very specific beginning and a very specific end to that episode of care. So it is really important during her PT care to figure out ways for her to optimize her exercise and optimize her physical activity and know when and how to insert those wisely into her day. And I'm actually going to toss out two resources for you folks. So she might be someone who would benefit from an online interactive exercise program that she can do either from work or from home. One resource is msworkouts.com and the other is msforward.org. Both of those resources you can find on the attached article to this webinar. So that's, those are my priorities for Ashley. Let's talk about the priorities for Dawn now. First and foremost is we've got to manage this young man's back pain. We have to empower him that to help her 
optimally, he has to help himself, and that means getting some treatment and some intervention for his back. That may be include some exercises like the one you see there in the picture, or it may also include making sure that Ashley has safe mobility and the appropriate adaptive equipment so that she doesn't have to hold on to his arm and, and she, he has to help her in that manner that can aggravate his back pain. So a really key issue that he can understand that her changing how she moves can impact his movement as well. PTs can also help establish exercise programs for weight loss. So I would really encourage him to come in and, and work on and establish a good aerobic exercise program, strength training program for his back, taking into consideration those challenges that he might have associated with his back. And lastly, we would work um, with using a gait belt wisely. Um, specifically, transfer training and properly helping with walking while using that gait belt. Um, and when to use it, when not to use it, and when to help and when not to help, communicating about that. Because ultimately, we want Ashley to have that autonomy and that independence, and we want Don to have that as well. And often, success and ultimate autonomy comes, and independence comes with using some of these tools and this adaptive equipment. So that lends itself to this slide about adapting to adaptive equipment, a benefit for both. So reducing her fall risk will help both of them. So requesting adaptive equipment, requesting a mobility aid such as a walker or a cane or a scooter is not just for the person with MS. It's not giving in to the disease. It's taking charge of their lives both individually and together. And ultimately, you can try a variety of assistive devices with a physical therapist. And, and honestly, if it doesn't help make your life easier or seem to kind of expand your world, then it's probably not the right device, and, and that's okay. That's okay. We'll go back to the drawing board and keep, keep investigating. Adaptive equipment would also help with fatigue management at work. So she's too tired after work. She doesn't have anything any energy for exercise, she doesn't even have energy for meal preparation. So figuring out types of adaptive equipment that may be helpful while she's at work can allow her to bank or conserve that very valuable energy during the day and be able to use it later on in the day for things that are more meaningful to her, like spending time with her husband and, or an exercise program. And the last bullet point talks about adaptive equipment and assistive devices for home and work. So this might be maybe rearranging the computer workstation or types of equipment that could help you get around the workplace more easily. This is where I would encourage um, us to call upon our friends, our occupational therapy friends, as well as PT. Um, and the purpose of that is Anytime we start to look at adaptive equipment at work or at home, it's generally not covered by Medicare or other private insurances. So any modifications to make, you might make to home or work aren't, aren't generally paid for by insurance. So it's really important that you consult with a PT or an occupational therapist to help you use your money wisely. Now, grants might be available or you can access vocational rehab for another resource that could help fund um, some of those some of those adaptive equipment as well. For those of you out there who don't know what vocational rehabilitation is, it's an organization that is provided by each state with the primary goal of keeping people working or finding a job that's suitable for their abilities. And quite often they can be quite helpful in my experience with helping people get the proper funding for equipment for home and work. So that said, with this adaptive equipment and with all of these changes that I've recommended, I'm certain that I probably overwhelmed them, so I would probably encourage them to consult with a mental health professional, someone like our beloved Roz. So Roz, can you share a little bit about how you would move forward with helping this lovely couple? Sure. Thanks, Mandy. So one of the first things that I keyed into um, in this vignette um, was that Ashley was starting to function less 
effectively in the workplace. Um, losing phone messages, generally being less organized so that her manager and her colleagues were, were noticing changes. But then when uh, she and uh, Don went to the doctor together, they both actually mentioned that they'd noticed changes um, to the neurologist. And so we now have to wonder whether um, uh, she is experiencing cognitive changes, and we'll talk about what we know about cognition in a, in a minute, but we also notice that Ashley is 58 years old. And for many of you women of the same age in the audience, you may have noticed uh, changes in your thinking or memory or your sharpness related to being perimenopausal or menopausal. So when a woman is of this age, we have to do two things. We have to first um, determine where she is um, with her menopausal phases um, and when these changes um, seem, to, seem to change and become more acute. But for anybody with MS who's experiencing some changes in cognition, we also, first and foremost, want to assess for depression. Because depression, as we'll talk about later, is extremely common in MS, and depression can impact a person's cognition. So the very first thing we would want to do is find out if Ashley is depressed, and if she is, treat that depression and then assess her cognition again. But for this particular uh, vignette, we're happy to report that they screened Ashley for depression. She is not depressed at this time. Um, she is experiencing some cognitive changes and we want her to be assessed. Um, and she might be assessed by a neuropsychologist or um, an occupational therapist or speech language pathologist. These these clinicians all do various kinds of screening because we want to find out where she has experienced some changes or losses from her prior abilities, but also we want to identify her areas of strength, the areas of cognition that are particularly, particularly strong for her because that's going to help um, the person who's working with her uh, recommend the accommodations or compensatory strategies that would help her function optimally at work, in her job, um, and at home. So if we go to the next slide, we'll begin to see just how important this is. So cognitive changes are one of the most common symptoms in MS. Um, upwards of 65% of people living with MS are going to experience some degree of cognitive change over the course of the disease. These changes are unrelated to level of physical disability. So one can have lots of physical impairments, but have, sorry, my papers keep dropping on the floor. Um, one can have lots of physical impairment and no cognitive changes whatsoever, or one can have um, significant cognitive changes and be physically intact. These changes um, generally progress slowly, but they are a primary cause of early departure from the workforce. So we really want to get in there quickly and find out what's going on, help them get the accommodations they need so that they can stay employed as long as they want to. And we certainly want that for Ashley if that's her priority. Uh, we also know that early treatment with a disease-modifying therapy may help to slow some of these changes, just as they slow other uh, forms of progression. Um, and we want people to stay active and engaged in their world, even though um, there are no specific brain games or brain exercises that can actually improve cognition in MS, but staying active and stimulated is just part of your overall cognitive wellness. So now I want to talk a little bit about Ashley and Dawn. So let's assume for a moment that we've helped Ashley. Um, she's getting some um, help from a rehabilitation therapist who's working with her on her cognitive strategies. 
Uh, maybe she is also using a mobility aid that's been requested by her PT and doing some other things to help herself. But in the meantime, um, she has experienced some significant losses, as has Don in his life. So together, they may be doing what we think of as very healthy grieving over these changes that aging has brought, that uh, the back problems that caused Don to have to leave his workplace, um, the loss of their ability to do some of the things together that they used to do. So when MS enters the picture and changes a person's lifestyle, uh, changes the way a person perceives him or herself, that's a grieving process. And before people can really do the adapting and problem solving and coping that they need to do, they need to be able to grieve over the changes. And when couples go through this, grieving together is a form of intimacy. It's a form of sharing so that then they can partner together to, to strategize on the next steps for optimizing uh, their life, for thriving, as we at CAMP do want them to be able to do. So a mental health professional can help people talk about those feelings. In addition, um, you know, we want Ashley and Don to be able to communicate with one another what's going on with them. What are their needs for their current life? What are their feelings about the changes? What are their priorities for the future? Because it's only by having this conversation that they can work together in a successful partnership. And sometimes it takes a third party, like a mental health professional, to jumpstart these difficult conversations. Often couples are afraid of hurting each other's feelings or saying the wrong thing or upsetting someone they love. And so as a mental health professional, we can help that communication process start. We can also give them some strategies for problem solving together to get to the place where they're achieving the goals that they both feel are important. And, you know, as Denise was talking about, this progressive form of MS progresses, and it progresses in an unpredictable way so that the future is unpredictable for couples like Ashley and Don. And so we want to help them plan for that unpredictability. We want to have them put safety nets in place so that they know what they would do if Ashley became unable to work or if they had to go to a different resource for their uh, health insurance. Um, so planning together for the future sometimes also needs the help of a mental health professional because as we all know, planning for unpredictability can be frightening. Um, and so people tend to put off things that are frightening, they don't wanna do it and so we can help them have that conversation in a safe environment um, and identify the resources that are out there to help them. Now, the last thing where I, as a mental health professional, would really want to help Ashley and Don is with their partnership. As their roles shift, as Don has become unable to do some of the things he used to be able to do related to his work, or as Ashley has had to give up some of her activities at home, we want to make sure that they are assisting each other, that they are each taking an active role to make sure that their household and their family life continues the way they want it to. And so each of them needs to be contributing. So uh, Denise had mentioned that perhaps Don could begin cooking. Whatever shifts like that they make in their relationship, it's important for it to be a balanced partnership so that each feels like he or she is giving and receiving, and that the relationship is satisfying for them. And we also want them to help each other with their wellness efforts. So if it's being physically active, if it is doing an exercise regimen or changing their diet or stopping smoking, which is critically important because we know smoking uh, speeds the progression of MS, um, and stopping helps to slow it down, we want them to support each other in those efforts because teamwork makes those difficult tasks feel easier. And so with that, we're going to turn it over 
uh, to James, and Denise is going to introduce us to him. Okay, thank you, Roz. Um, so this is our next vignette. So this is James. James is a 45-year-old divorced African-American man. He has two adult sons. He is a traveling pediatrician for several rural hospitals. For a long time, he's had trouble walking and driving because of a what was called a pinched nerve in his back. After lots of tests, he's finally diagnosed as having primary progressive MS after he saw several specialists and after dealing with this for several months. He finally gets in to see a neurologist, and when the neurologist asks him how things are going, he admits that he's having challenges lifting his right leg. He has trouble buttoning his shirt and typing. He's also having some sexual problems with his girlfriend, and she doesn't even know that he was diagnosed with MS. He tells his neurologist, I don't need anything though, I'm, I'm just fine. He continues to work as a pediatrician, but is truly concerned about disclosing this to his employer, about continuing to drive, and his ability to care for his patients. His sons are home from college for the summer. They notice that James has resumed cigarette smoking, something that he had quit for several years, and that he's drinking more alcohol in the evenings to a point that they're worried about this. They're also worried about his mood, his ability to work, his continuation to live independently. They're afraid to talk with their dad, though, about any of these issues. So another quick poll. What would you recommend to James's sons? Would you suggest one of the following? Suggest he see a mental health professional? Should his sons call his doctor or healthcare provider to share their concerns? Should they share their concerns with their dad? Should they tell him to quit smoking and drinking? And again, none of these is necessarily the correct answer. We're just interested to see what people think is the best answer. So most people said that they would share their concerns with their dad. I would agree with that. Um, and I guess we had taken one off that still came up on the poll, suggest he retire, which none of us would suggest. We want to keep our patients working for as long as they safely feel they can. So um, again, this is a very common patient that I see often. Um, hopefully I've known James for a little bit of time so we can kind of start digging in a little bit deeper beyond just being diagnosed with MS. But I would highly recommend that James quit smoking. As Roz just said, we know that smoking, even a little bit, um, definitely progresses MS and it helps with nothing. He also needs to eat a healthy diet, which might be a little bit more difficult for him to do being on the road. Also, if he's alone most nights at home for dinner, he might not feel like cooking. We want to make sure that he manages any other comorbidities. So this would be something like high blood pressure, diabetes, or depression. We want to talk about decreasing how much alcohol he's uh, intaking, especially if this is more of a coping strategy. I am okay with my patients having an occasional alcoholic beverage, but when it's used in excess is when I get worried. It could also increase issues for balance and falls. I'd want to talk with him about medications that are out there for primary progressive MS, the risk and benefits, possible clinical trials, and even though he says he's just fine, is he open to any of these options, symptom management, uh, medications for his MS, or speaking with somebody about what he's dealing with. Okay, and I think next is Roz to talk about some of the emotional issues that James is probably dealing with. So here's my diagram again, and only it looks a little bit different this time, because right now I think that James may be feeling very overwhelmed um, by what's going on in his life, worried about his career that he loves, uh, worried about what his sons might think about him and what's going on, and apparently worried about sharing this information with his girlfriend. So I would again want to know um, whether James is depressed. And because depression is so common in people with MS, I would want to have him screened right away to try to determine, is this the normal grieving that I was talking about before or is he really depressed, feeling so overwhelmed as though his whole self 
has been taken over by MS and he just doesn't feel like himself anymore. So depression is one of the most common symptoms of MS. And I'm saying that very carefully and very specifically. This is a symptom of the disease. It is as deserving of treatment as any other symptoms like bladder issues or pain um, or stiffness. Um, and in MS, depression seems to have multiple causes. We know that there are changes in the brain, changes in the immune system, as well as those psychosocial or daily challenges that we're talking about in these vignettes. It's sort of a triple whammy, um, which makes depression so common. And it is underdiagnosed and undertreated. Uh, many people with MS are uncomfortable reporting it to their healthcare provider or they think it's perfectly natural to be depressed because you have MS, Zzzt, wrong answer. Depression is never normal, it's never okay. It is a debilitating um, condition that severely impacts your quality of life, your ability to function. And for somebody like James, uh, really threatens his safety. We know that people who are depressed, who try to cope or self-medicate with alcohol, um, are at increased risk for suicide or self-harm, and the rate of suicide in people with MS is about twice that of the general population. So we really want to uh, treat James's depression quickly so that he can get his footing again and figure out um, what to do about work and what to do with his relationships. And the really good news is that no matter what causes the depression in a person with MS, um, it responds well to treatment and it deserves that careful attention and treatment from a mental health professional. So we have some emotional health priorities. Again, emotional health is part of that wellness circle that we looked at. Um, James needs to figure out what he wants to say to the people in his life about his MS and what kind of feedback he is looking for from them. When you disclose to somebody else it's really important to think, who's the person who needs to know? What do we want that person to understand about MS? And what are we hoping that they can do to assist or support? And many people, when you tell them, they, they just don't know how to respond. They're, they're shocked or they're, they, they're just uncomfortable. So they might not say anything or they may not say what you want them to say. And so we have to help James figure out how he wants to disclose and why and what he's looking for from his support team. We want him to be considering his employment options. Now, perhaps he can continue doing exactly what he's doing um, if he gets some strategies in place um, and we can make sure that his driving stays safe and that he's safe in his world and that he can provide optimal care um, to patients. Um, but he also might want to consider another track he might follow if he had to change. He has great education and expertise. So it may be that with some thinking and some, some conversations with a vocational person, he might be able to just shift his direction a little bit um, to, to function optimally in spite of his MS. And of course, we want him to do that same planning for the future that we hope anybody else living with a chronic unpredictable disease should do. Uh, now, it, it seems to me that James and his sons have some conversations they need to have. I was really thrilled to see the results of the polls that you thought the best thing for his sons to do was to share their concerns. This, this may not be a threesome that have really talked a lot in the past. We don't know if that's their been always been their past history since the kids were little. We don't know if this is a cultural um, situation or whether their feelings are getting in the way, but as mental health professionals, we could help them. We could help the sons think about how they want to uh, share their concerns with their father. We could see them all together as a family and help them communicate. But clearly, James probably would like something from his sons, and his sons would like something from James. So if we can help them have that conversation more comfortably, then that's a way that we can um, help them. And of course, we have to help James figure out 
why he hasn't disclosed to his girlfriend, particularly if this is a person with whom he's having a fairly serious relationship or a relationship that he hopes will continue. Is he afraid that she will reject him or is he embarrassed to talk about the things that are bothering him as a result of his MS? Um, so we want to help him decide whether he wants to share this information with her. And if so, is there some way that we could help him do that? And he also might want to think through the various ways she might react so that he can prepare himself emotionally. Um, and we can also provide him with some resources that he could share with her to help explain his MS. So as mental health professionals, we can really help James re-engage with the people around him so he gets uh, the support that he needs. Um, so now Mandy um, obviously is going to have some physical therapy priorities for James. So talk to you, Mandy. Certainly. Thanks, Roz. So one of the primary priorities for, for James from my perspective, but I also suspect it would be from James's perspective as well, would be for him to continue to keep working. And in order for him to be able to work, vehicle modifications may be necessary. And with, in order to get vehicle modifications or any types of adaptations to the vehicle, um, an assessment might, must be done. And a driving assessment can kind of help guide and determine what his cognitive and physical abilities are and what adaptations might be appropriate. Those adaptations might be include maybe some hand control since he's having some fine motor challenges, maybe um, special seating arrangements, and maybe even potentially a, a door that could help um, accommodate a, a wheelchair in the future. Um, driving assessments, unfortunately, are generally not covered by insurance, and generally the modifications aren't covered by insurance either. So this becomes kind of a costly endeavor. Um, usually, at least in our area, the assessments done by an occupational therapist who specializes in driver's rehabilitation, and they generally run around $300 to $400. So they are, they are quite pricey, but again, quite valuable if it's something that James wishes, wishes to do. And as far as an exercise program goes for James, this is pretty key for him. You know, he sounds like he's a guy who's um, pretty determined, pretty masculine, likes to do, uh, a high, operate at a high level of function given that he's a physician and has a lot going on in his world. So helping him figure out an exercise program that helps him optimize his strength, balance, flexibility, and aerobic, aerobic health will be something we focus on. It would help him, we would help him to prioritize his exercises, specifically the exercises that address those functional deficits. Because we don't want someone like James wasting valuable energy on exercises that aren't helping him to get a return on his investment or helping him to optimize his function. He's not someone who will stick to that. So helping him prioritize his exercises as well as um, figuring out a way to fit them into his busy routine will be two things we work on. And next is fatigue management. You know, we would probably start with, with the basics and we would talk about what's the difference between primary fatigue versus secondary fatigue. Primary fatigue is fatigue that results from the disease process itself, from the demyelination and the slow nerve conduction. Whereas secondary fatigue could be the result of deconditioning perhaps or inadequate nutrition, maybe poor sleep hygiene, if we can figure out and kind of problem solve, again, do a lot of detective work through conversation, what might be contributing to the fatigue, then we can intervene with other members of the healthcare team as well. He also might benefit from some cooling devices. He's somebody who is in and out of his vehicle, it sounds like, all day, pretty physical, working with kiddos as a pediatrician. So changes in his body temperature might be common and, and truly as little as a tenth of a degree can change um, motor performance. So using things like uh, 
cool wraps around the wrists or maybe something less obvious like a, a cool pack that he can put underneath his shirt and around his core and his back might be helpful for him. The last aspect of fatigue management that would be helpful would be to talk about what we call the four P's of fatigue management. And it's pacing, prioritizing, positioning, and planning. Pacing would be resting before he's tired or just kind of structuring some intermittent planned rest breaks into his day. Prioritizing would be encouraging him to kind of step back and say, hey, okay, let's do the most energy intensive activities when I have the most energy. Or maybe that means earlier in the day, schedule the most physical patients. Positioning, so perhaps rather than sitting down in a stool, he would sit in a supported chair to visit with his clients because it requires less energy to sit in a nice supportive chair than it would be in a stool or stand. And lastly, planning again, um, encouraging him to plan ahead and planning as much as the disease allows, anticipating those fluctuations and kind of having alternative options in his back pocket if things kind of become, become difficult. James, too, might be someone who could benefit from adaptive equipment, um, a scooter or a walker or some type of cane may allow him to conserve some of that energy during the workday. And it may be tools that can allow him to navigate more efficiently between patients. However, you know, I suspect that James might be someone who would take a little bit of persuasion to convince him to use this type of equipment. I suspect there's some sadness, anger, maybe some frustration, some fear of what others might think when he uses those types of devices. So a big job for me would be to help him find a device that works for him and that allows him to do what he wants to do and help him realize that, again, it's, it's a tool. It just as any other tool he would use as a physician. And that last bullet point is about insurance. So I suspect James being a physician is quite familiar with insurance and all of the challenges that it often poses. But specifically to James and others with progressive MS, it's not uncommon for them to need to access PT often, whether it's during bouts of progression or maybe some changes in function or simply just for tune-ups, for maybe um, re resetting an, an exercise program or figuring out a different piece of equipment. But people often find themselves struggling between this need for PT and the fact that they benefit from PT, from PT and insurance coverage. It coverage. Um, perhaps there are limitations in the number of visits or with Medicare, there's, there's a, a cap on outpatient physical therapy, or it could just simply be high copays or high deductibles. I've seen some clients with uh, copays as high as $70 a visit, which is unachievable if you want to see a client twice a week or even once a week, that gets to be quite high. So, this makes accessing PT quite challenging at times. So we do have to be collaborative and we have to be creative in these situations. So reducing frequency, maybe once a week or once every two weeks or even once a month, um, maybe how the, the, the PT episode of care is structured. Regardless, focusing on specific goals and encouraging progress is, is easier to justify to insurance companies. There are also alternatives, particularly with Mer uh, Medicare, for skilled maintenance therapy, and those come also with a variety of rules and restrictions, but that can be an alternative for some of those uh, folks who have Medicare as their insurance provider. Regardless, I would just encourage people to be committed, creative, and, and collaborative with your PT and to try to figure out how to manage the insurance barriers that, that may present to, to James and to, to you. So what are some of the physical therapy priorities for James and his support network? So his boys and his girlfriend can certainly support him by encouraging him to continue to do what he wants and to continue to do it perhaps in a slightly different way and to learn that that's okay. Um, reinforcing and reframing that the use of tools or adaptive equipment can perhaps help him to continue to do these things that he wants to do independently and that they all want to be able to do together. 
they can help remind him to exercise, maybe with text messages or maybe needing to work out or go for a walk or a sporting activity together, similar to what the images show here, a, a gentleman doing some adaptive cycling or the other picture with swimming and a, and a canine companion. But I think ultimately what's more important than what is done together is the fact that they need to have this conversation together. They need to talk about with James about how they can best support him and how he can best continue to have a quality relationship with, with all of them and to articulate the importance of doing all of those activities together for their relationships. Okay, so I hope you can all see our lovely, beloved founder, Jimmy Huga. So we'd like to close. We've covered a lot today, and we've hope, we hope that um, this conversation that we've had among the three of us and with all of you is, has been thoughtful and interesting and has helped you reconnect and uh, rethink how you're managing your MS. So whether you have secondary progressive MS or primary progressive MS, a can-do spirit like Jimmy has had all, had had all those years can help you thrive. Thank you so much for your attention, and I will pass back to Rachel. All right, great. Thank you so much to Mandy, Denise, and Roz for a very informative presentation. I know there's so much more we can get into with the different types of progressive MS, but we do have a few questions that I'd like to get to, and we can get our healthcare professionals feedback on. So now we received a lot of questions from people who have been diagnosed with uh, primary progressive MS for years, 20, 30 plus years. And they feel written off by their healthcare team because of their age. A lot of the times when they're seeing a symptoms, their doctor just says, oh, it's due to aging. Denise, what advice might you suggest to have their concerns addressed during the doctor's visits? So that's a great question um, because we all hopefully naturally age and things are going to happen to us and things are going to slow down. Um, but the difference with primary progressive MS is are things, especially neurological or uh, ambulation, walking, are they slower than somebody we would expect at their same age? So a lot of these same caveats pertain with trying to exercise, um, even if it's you know chair yoga, taking a five minute walk three times a day, staying active. We work a lot with primary care doctors to manage other issues the patient is dealing with. It can be very confusing though to know what is related to their MS and what is related to other um, medical issues that somebody might be having. So it's very much a collaborative effort. Oftentimes when somebody is new to our practice or new to me, I'll try to see them back pretty frequently so I can kind of get an understanding of the patient, of their MS, of their other health care issues. Um, so we can try to be as clear as we can, but it's still not always uh, crystal clear. Great. And Roz, did you have anything to add at all? Well, I was just thinking about somebody who might be considered to be older. And I, I wouldn't want to work with a doctor who wrote anything off. To right, it. I agree. Mm -hmm. I, I think that wellness is something that we strive for throughout our lifespan, and we need to be working with a healthcare team that respects that and honors that. Whatever changes we have, whether it's related to MS, to aging, or other health conditions, as Denise mentioned, so pick your team carefully. That's a great point, Roz. Great point. Awesome. Thank you, both ladies. So now we have a question for Mandy um, on the physical therapy side. Mandy, could you uh, give a, a brief uh, description of the differences between an exercise physiologist versus a physical therapist? Right. So I'll speak more towards the physical therapist, what, what a physical therapist is. So we, are, we work in primarily rehabilitation. So our goal, our intention is to see people and particularly people who have MS, we see them for an evaluation and then a period of, of visits and then there's an end to that care. Um, our training is in wound care, our training is in 
burns, our training is in exercise, in therapeutic activities, our training is in strokes. We have a variety of uh, of training, I guess I should say, and that differs, whereas an exercise physiologist would just have more of an emphasis on how the body responds to just exercise, whereas we kind of look at more of the body holistically. Um, does that help a little bit, I hope? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. We just, yeah, we're looking for a little yeah. bit of a clarification. And now good, uh, good back question. on the physical therapy side, there's a lot of people out there with limited or very low mobility. Would getting involved in um, an ongoing physical therapy program help prevent further decline in their mobility? Absolutely. I mean, I am a firm believer that everyone can exercise. Everyone can do something good for their physical health, even if it's something as simple as deep breathing or participating in range of motion exercises, either completed by a skilled physical therapist or provided by a, a caregiver who's trained by a physical therapist. They can, they can benefit from that. The, as I alluded to with James, there are restrictions, though, however, as far as what insurance allows often with ongoing physical therapy. So if physical therapy isn't working towards a specific goal or a specific series of goals, um, then physical therapy is, is no longer appropriate or it's, you've met that maximum therapeutic benefit. There are maintenance options. Um, however, sometimes we have to be creative and look towards um, other caregivers or I often engage uh, college students to participate in eager college students who are in, interested in healthcare to participate in, in helping with the exercise program if it needs to be ongoing. Go ahead, so, Rachel, let me just, and, and correct me, uh, Mandy, if I'm wrong, but I think people's expectations need to be in line with, with what we know. So it's not as though physical therapy in and of itself can um, stop the progression of MS disability um, or even necessarily slow disability progression. But I think what you what you describe when you talk about Ashley and you talk about James is that you want to help them function at the best level they possibly can given whatever their limitations are. And you want to help them stay safe, um, comfortable, and independent. And so I think it's just important to have those goals in mind as being critically important and not just focus on can you keep MS disability from progressing, which none of us at this point really knows a lot about doing. Great. Okay. Thank you for that extra feedback there, Roz. Now, a uh, question for you, Roz. Uh, we have a couple participants that are very fortunate to have support partners who want to help them manage their disease. But the people with MS also want to have a sense of independence. So how can those people maintain their independence without causing any emotional damage in their relationship? So oh, this is a great question. And we get it a lot from couples. Um, support partners often are confused about when to step in and help, particularly if they're worried about their loved one's safety and when to stand back. And to me, it all hinges on good, healthy, honest communication. Um, the person with MS um, needs to be able to communicate to others when it's a great day and they feel like doing things on their own and they feel com comfortable and confident that they can do that. So they might say, I'm really doing pretty well today. Um, let me go at on my own and I'll let you know if I need help. Um, by the same token, if it's later in the day or a not so good day, uh, nobody, no matter how much that person loves you, can read your mind. They cannot guess. So you would have to say, today's not a very good day or here it is four o'clock and you know what? I am used up, dried out and done and I really need your help. So with that ongoing communication back and forth, nobody has to guess, nobody has to feel resentful. Um, and it's out there in the open for them to, to talk about and problem solve. Great. Great advice for anybody in a relationship. <laughs> 
Now, a question uh, for Denise. We have a lot of questions about secondary progressive MS, mm -hmm. and there doesn't seem to be as much information out there as the other forms of MS. Mm -hmm. So now, are there any clues or symptoms to watch for if one thinks they're transitioning from relapsing remitting to secondary progressive MS? So I feel like um, progression has become kind of like a dirty word with my patients when they ask, am I progressing? Or I have patients that to me are clearly still relapsing, but they haven't had a relapse because they're taking their medicine and it's working for them. Um, and so sometimes they feel since they haven't had a relapse, are they still relapsing? So sometimes it's, it's a lot of education on our part to clarify that with patients. Progression to me, um, again, this is not an overnight thing. This is why we want to see our patients fairly regularly and take a very detailed history and a detailed examination for comparison. So to me, progression would be somebody that, um, for instance, maybe they did the MS walk three miles three years ago. The next year, they could only do two miles. The next year they could only do two miles, but, but using you know an AFO or some type of other assistance. So they haven't had a new issue. It's the same issue that over time has just kind of steadily um, taken away a little bit more of their function, being able to be independent with that. So it can take time to really decide if somebody is secondary progressive and no longer relapsing remitting. The medications we have now, again, it seems like it's really extending um, when patients go into secondary progressive than some of the numbers that we presented at the beginning of the um, webinar. Um, it still happens, but it, it doesn't happen as often. I also refer patients a lot to the disability scale, which is a scale that looks at a huge cohort of patients with MS. And depending on how long they've been living with MS and how well or not well they're doing kind of gives more of a prognosis. Because it's really what patients are asking is, you know, what to expect 5, 10, 15 years down the road based on what I'm seeing in their exam now. And how do we get behind that to try and prevent that or slow things down. Great. And, you know, kind of talking about the future, we have time for this one last question here. So now many people are looking to plan for their future care as their MS progresses. And based on your experience with MS patients, what are some key areas that you suggest they address? And Mandy, would you want to lead off that question? Can, can you say that one more time? I couldn't hear you very well, Rachel. Absolutely. Yeah. So as Thank people you. are looking to plan for their future care when their MS progresses, what are some key areas you suggest they address while they're doing their planning? Thank you. That was very helpful. Okay. So from a physical therapy perspective, we were working with people's mobility, right? So what is key is to recognize that there are often some restrictions when it comes to planning long-term for mobility equipment, such as specifically wheelchairs and, and in the home planning. So we really encourage people to consult with a physical therapist or an occupational therapist to plan for things you may or may not need in the future when it comes to um, wheelchairs and adaptive equipment just in case because with the restrictions on insurance you may not be able to get that in the future or you may have to wait if for some reason you would need it sooner. Great. All right. And Denise, how about any feedback uh, for you for future planning for patients of yours? Yeah, so I mean, one point I want to make is that just because somebody has progressive MS, it doesn't mean that we expect they're going to end up in a wheelchair. You know, we see the whole gamut, again, of patients. So, um, you know, certainly that can be for some patients, but our goal is to keep them as active and as healthy and working as long as possible. I think it's hard because, as Ross said, MS is very unpredictable. Um, I think planning for the future, we want to be hopeful, but we also want to have realistic expectations. Um, so I agree with Mandy, like some equipment, you don't want to just go out and purchase if you don't really need it because there are limitations from insurance. Um, if I have patients that are building like a new home or if they're moving somewhere, I try to be mindful 
about um, what that might look like in planning for the future in terms of, you know, maybe a larger bathroom or having built-in grab bars or first floor master bedroom. Um, but it, it's really different for every patient and it, it can be a very fine line talking with patients about this as to not, you know, freaking them out that this is necessarily going to be their future. But again, also maintaining hope and being realistic with things. Great. And any kind of closing remarks on that, Roz? Um, I, you know, in the years that I've worked with individuals and families, one of the things we've talked about is how you, you sort of look your worst fears in the face. Um, and everybody has them. What if I can't work? What if I can't walk? What if I can't see? And then you plan. You say, well, what would I do if any of those things happen? And by doing some planning way ahead of time and creating some roadmaps for yourself, you also feel safer. You don't have to sit and worry and worry and worry about them because you've already figured out your strategy for how you would handle that. So you plan for the worst while hoping for the best. And if nothing bad happens, all you've lost is a little planning time. Um, and if things do tend to go south as, as time goes on, you've, you've got tools and strategies that you've worked out with yourself and your support team. All right. Well, that is all the time we have for tonight's presentation. So I just want to thank Denise, Roz, and Mandy, and all of you out there for your patience with our technical challenges. But I hope you found this uh, presentation informative, and we'll also follow up with uh, the recording and the library article that the team created with some great follow-up resources for you to check out. So thanks again to all of our presenters. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Okay, and before we close out for the tonight, I would like to inform you of some additional resources you may find informative and helpful. On the Can Do MS site, Can Do MS Dot org, you will find archived webinars, e-news, library articles, and Can Do On Demand. You can also submit a question to ask the Can Do team, which will be answered by our team of MS experts. So how can you help Can Do MS continue to provide educational programs at no cost? Join the Kick MS squad. So Kick MS is our new peer-to-peer -peer fundraising platform, and it's super easy to get started. So you can do really anything to raise money for programs, just like the one you attended today. So you can ask for donations instead of gifts on your birthday, take part in a run or a walk event, host a barbecue, or hold a bake sale. The ideas are really endless, and the best part is you'll be helping other families such as yours have free access to our programs. So please visit cando-ms.org slash kickms to get started. And CanDo is also excited to introduce MS Path to Care, an initial educational initiative that aims to empower people affected by MS to be active partners in their healthcare experience. So we invite you to explore these resources by visiting mspath2care.com. Our next presentation in our webinar series will be on Wednesday, September 12th, at the same time, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. The topic will cover hot topics in MS. And please do note, this program will take place on a Wednesday instead of our normal Tuesday. And as always, you can register for the webinar series free of charge on the Can Do MS website. For those participating live tonight, you will see a survey appear on your computer. Please take a moment to complete the survey and share your input. Your feedback helps us continue to improve our webinar and series. Thank you for joining us tonight and have a great evening.